morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning. I apologize for starting a little bit late, but we will get started. So if all of you would please stand. We'll call the worship. The other thing is, don't pay any attention to the songs that are in the bulletin. And I apologize, brothers. I know you try to do what you can do, but when I started going through them, I had to change. So they will be right on the screen. They will be right on the screen. Um, hang on. worship this morning comes from Nehemiah, and I'll be reading the uh, last half of verse 5 and then also verse 6. Stand up, blessed be the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You, Lord, are the only God you created the heavens, the highest heavens with all their stars, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them, and all the stars of heaven worship you. This morning we come to worship God together, and we will start by singing a song that's called When We All Get to Heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing. Shout the victory while we walk the pilgrim pathway. Clouds will overspread the sky, but when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sign. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be! When we all Jesus will sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day! Rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come this morning to worship you, we just come recognizing you are the great creator, as the um, words that we read from Nehemiah illustrated to us this morning. We just come humbled that you would even think of us, your creation, to provide a way that we could have our salvation and our freedom from sins. Father, be with us as we go through service this morning. We just pray for Jeff as he brings a message. We pray for those who weren't able to be here, whatever their reason might be. And if it be uh, due to illness, we just pray that you would heal them. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We talked about Jesus and seeing him when we all get to heaven. Let's sing a little bit about Ferris, Lord Jesus, 288. And we talked about, continue talking about his creation. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, oh, thou of God and man, the Son, thee will I share. 
Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, the glories of my God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus, the name that calms my fears, blessed be the name of the Lord. Tis music in the sinner's ears. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Breaks the power of canceled sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His blood can make the foulest clean. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. I never shall forget that day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When Jesus washed my sins away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. As we prepare our hearts for our Lord's Supper this morning, meet with him around the table. Sing beneath the cross of Jesus. Beneath the cross of Jesus. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. The shadow of the mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the wilderness, a rest upon the way. From the burning of the noontide heat and the burning 
is where heaven's love and heaven's justice meet. As to the holy patriarch, that wondrous stream was given. So seems my Savior's cross to me a ladder up to hell. Upon that cross of Jesus, mine eye at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from thy smitten heart with tears to wonders I confess the wonders of his glorious love and my own worthlessness. I take a cross I shadow for my abiding I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of my face, content to let the world go by, to know no gain nor loss, my sinful self.
he called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals. One on the right, one on the left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They divided his clothes and cast lots. The people stood watching, and even the leaders kept scoffing. He saved others. Let him save himself if this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked came offering him sour wine and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. The inscription was above him, This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Are you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The other answered, rebuking him, Don't you even fear God? Even you are undergoing same punishment? We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom? And he said, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land till three, because the sun's light had failed. The curtain of the sanctuary was split down the middle. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your spirit I entrust my spirit, saying this, breathe his last. When the centurion saw what happened, he began to glorify God, saying, this man really was righteous. All the crowd that had gathered for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, went home, striking their chests. For all who knew him, including the women who followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching him. a lot of darkness. However, let's move on to 24, starting in 44. Jesus told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds understand the scriptures. And he also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day in repentance for, for forgiveness of sin would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. It does not matter how much darkness we experience in our lives. And I know some experience it more than others. Jesus is risen, and he has paid the price for you and me, so that we can have an opportunity for being faithful to be with him that's, quite frankly, what we need to have on our mind right now. Let's pray. Lord, we, we glorify you. We glorify your name come together in the name of Jesus, our Savior. <laughs> Lord, I pray that this time we would 
lay aside the encumbrances that crowd around us from the world, whether it be temptation, suffering, pain. Lord, I pray that you would help us to fix our eyes on the one who can take that all away. Through the hope of eternity where everything will be perfect. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus was willing to pay the price that we cannot begin to pay. I pray, Lord, again, that you would turn our minds toward that hope so that light able to shine within our lives here, knowing that it will shine forever in eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. You are to construct the altar of acacia wood. The altar must be a square, seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and it must be four and a half feet high. Take horns for it on its four corners. The horns are to be of one piece, overlaid with bronze. Make its pots for removing ashes, and its shovels, basins, feet forks, and fire pans. Make all of its utensils of bronze. Construct a grate for it, a bronze mesh, and make four bronze rings on the mesh at its four corners. Set it below under the altar's ledge so that the mesh comes halfway up the altar. Then make the poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. The poles are to be inserted into the rings so that the poles are on the two sides of the altar when it is carried. Construct the altar with boards so that it is hollow. They are to, they are to make it just as it was shown to you on the mountain. You are to make the courtyard for the tabernacle. Make the hangings of the south of the courtyard out of the fine linen, 150 feet long on that side. There are to be 20 posts and 20 bronze bases. The hooks and bands of the posts must be silver. Then make the hangings on the north side 150 feet long. There are to be 20 posts and 20 bronze bases. The hooks and bands of the posts must be silver. Make the hangings of the courtyard on the west side 75 feet long, 
used to have four posts, including their four bases. All the posts around the courtyard are to be banded with silver and there and have silver hooks, bronze bases. The length of the courtyard is to be 150 feet and width 75 feet at each end and the height 7.5 feet. All of it made of finest spun linen. The bases of the posts must be bronze. All the tools of the tabernacle for every use and all of its tent pegs as well as all of the tent pegs of the courtyard are to be made of bronze. You are to command the Israelites to bring me pure, pure oil from crushed olives for the light in order to keep the lamp burning continually in the tent of meeting outside the veil that is in front of the testimony. Aaron and his sons are to tend the lamp from evening until morning before the Lord. This is to be a permanent statute for the Israelites throughout their generations. thankful that you have spoken through your scriptures and that you 
continue to speak through your scripture. And Father, may we humble ourselves this morning before your word in its full authority. Hear what you have to say to us. And then for us to live according. But before we approach your word this morning, Lord, we ask that you forgive us of our sin. And we ask you, Lord, to forgive us in the exact same way in which we choose to forgive those who sin against us. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to study the scripture this morning. To the law and the testimony, then, we're ready to go into Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And this morning I have some questions for you. The first question is this. Does how we spend our time matter? Does it really make a difference how we choose to spend our time? Now let me ask you this question. Will God hold us accountable for how we use our time? And the answer to that question is absolutely yes. As we're going to see this morning. Another question that I want to ask this morning because there are many who look at our text today and have a certain way of seeing things. Has God determined how things will go in our lives? Are our lives predestined? Does God cause things to happen in our lives to produce a specific result based upon what God has predetermined for our lives? And then the answer to that question is absolutely not. This passage that we're not going, to, or the passage that we're looking at this morning, does not suggest that somehow our lives are predetermined. By God. Remember, that would eliminate free will. You and I are created with a free will. We are given the ability to choose. But we must always remember that we are held accountable for our choices. There are times when the chapter and verse breakdown that we have in the Bible is extremely useful and helpful. It just makes it easier to find things, doesn't it? But there are times when these chapter and verses become a hindrance. And in this particular set of circumstances, the way that the book of Ecclesiastes is broken down for us, and keep in mind these chapter and verses are man-made. This is something that man has devised to simply make it easier to find things. But these chapters and verses were not in the original letters and writing. They were something that was added much, much later. So our text this morning begins actually in chapter 2 and verses 24 through 26. And these are the verses that we've looked at the last three weeks. So I want to go back and pick it up where Solomon actually picks up our text for today. Ecclesiastes 2 beginning in verse number 24. There is nothing better for man than to eat, drink, and 
and enjoy his work. I have seen that even this is from God's hand. This is a gift. Solomon is referring to the gifts that God has given man. And then man is accountable for what he does with those gifts. Verse 25. Because who can eat and who can enjoy life apart from him? So here's where the choice begins. Are these gifts received from God, enjoyed with God, and used for God's purposes? That's the first test that we go through. And then on the basis of how we use these gifts that God has given us, Solomon tells us what happens. For to the man who is pleasing in his sight. So for those who properly use and enjoy the gifts that God has given, that individual is seen as being pleasing in God's sight. And to those who please God, he gives wisdom knowledge and joy but to the sinner and the sinner is the one who has received the gifts from God but does not use them according to God's standard then this is what becomes of his life he gives the task of gathering and accumulating in order to give to the one who is pleasing in God's sight. This too is futile and a pursuit of the wind. And now Solomon is going to continue this thought here. He did not end his point here. Now he is simply going to extrapolate upon that one gift that every human being is given. And that is the gift of time. And the question becomes, what do you and I do with the gift of time that we are given? Solomon says, there is an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under heaven. A time to give birth and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to avoid embracing. A time to search, and a time to count as loss. A time to keep, and a time to throw away. A time to tear, and a time to sow. A time to be silent, and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. And then Solomon asked this question, which ties us back to verse 26. 
What does the worker gain from his struggles? So, what does the sinner gain from all of his struggles? I have seen the task that God has given people to keep them occupied. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also put eternity in their hearts. But man cannot discover the work God has done from beginning to end. <coughs> now Solomon comes back to how he began things in 2.24. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and enjoy the good life. The good life as defined by God or man? As defined by God, as we've seen last week. God is the one who determines what a good life looks like. You and I do not determine what a good cold life looks like. It is also the gift of God. Whenever anyone eats, drinks, and enjoys all his effort. I know that all God does will last forever. There is no adding to it or taking from it. God works so that people will be in awe of him. And in the original language, the word for fear is here. And I wish the Holman would have gone ahead and translated that as fear instead of awe. And then Solomon says, whatever is has already been. And whatever will be already is. God repeats what has happened. And that takes us back to what Solomon was talking about in chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes. So the question that Solomon is dealing with is, what about time? What do we know about time? And then more importantly, what do we do with our time? So here's our spiritual life principle for today. God will teach the righteous. God will teach the righteous how to manage and appreciate there have been numerous books and programs written on time management. Well, there's only one time management system that works, and that's the time management that God has taught in the Scripture. And when you and I view time as God views time, and when you and I use our time according to God's plan, there will always be more than enough time in your day and in your life. Our time slips away when our priorities are wrong. When you and I have our priorities right, there'll always be enough time to do what is important and most valuable. Number one in your outline this morning, the first thing we need to understand is God created Time 
as we know it and understand it has not always existed. There was no time, but there was a time when no time existed. Because it was God who created time and space. And time and space exist for the purpose of this physical creation. God is not limited by time. God doesn't wear a watch nor keep a calendar. God created time for the purposes of this physical creation. And just like everything else, there's a response that man must respond to in reference to time. Letter A, God rules over time. Since God created time, since God is creator, he rules over time. Time exists because of God. Time continues to exist because of God. And time will continue to exist as long as God says so. You and I are not ruler over time. You and I are not rulers over our own time. Let it be. We understand that God works within time. Even though God is not limited by time or space, he still chooses to work within time. This means God is present. This means God is active. Amen. God did not create and simply walk away. God is ever present. God is ever active. The sun came up today because of God. Amen? And if it's up to God, the sun will set tonight because that is part of God's plan for his creation. But he is the one who continues to work within time. And then let her see. God will end time. It won't be global warming that ends time. It won't be a nuclear weapon that ends time. God, when he decides, will end time. And time and space, as we understand it, will no longer exist. God is going to create a new place. And boy, is that going to be a wonderful place. And God will establish the rules for that new place. And he will continue to rule over that place. And he will continue to work within that place. So, there are things that happen that we have absolutely no control over. And we need to be okay with that. Because we're not God. We, we have created nothing. And we rule over nothing. Everything that we have is ultimately a gift God. So there are things in life that happen that we have no control of. But much of our life we do have control of. And this is what Solomon is trying to get us to understand in these verses. Number two in your outline. Man is responsible Time is a gift from God. How many of you are 
enjoying your Christmas present. Your gifts that you receive. Dean got a three pound candy bar for Christmas. I thought the value was gone. You got more willpower than I thought you had. I was wrong. I thought the truth was going to be gone by then. But remember, you and I did the pizza buffet before. Love you, brother. Time is not a tool. Time is a gift. And it's a gift from God. We've all tried to figure out how to get more time, how to That's an impossibility, isn't it? All that we have is what we've been given. And because time is a gift from God, then let it be time is to be respected. Just like every other gift that God has given us, all of his gifts are to be respected. The world tells us that everything that we have belongs to us. God tells us that everything that we have is a gift from him. The world tells us to focus on property rights. God tells us to focus on how we can use those gifts that he has given to us. And as I said earlier, We're all given time. There, there are people today on this earth who will not eat. They will not eat. Even though eating is a gift from God. There are people today who will not work. Because either it's not available or they're not in the ability to do the work. Work is a gift from God. So not every gift of God is available to everyone all of the time. But this is the exception. We're all given the gift of time. And this is why Solomon spends the most time I'm talking about time. And he says that there are things that you and I cannot control. And we are not to worry about those things. But Solomon says there are many things that we have control over in reference to our time. So why is it that as a society today, we never have enough time. Well, here's the reason why. Let her see. It's wisdom. And God.
godly wisdom alone that allows for the proper use of time. And here's how this works. It goes back to verse 26 of chapter 2. Solomon says that you and I have a choice on how we're going to view life. We have a choice on how we're going to view the basic gift that God has given us. How do we handle the simple things of life like eating and drinking? How do we handle the gift of work that God has given us? Well, all of those things can be used in excess. Can. And when those gifts are used in excess, what does that what then happens to us? Are we in a position of where we are pleasing God by using what He has given us? In proper manner or have we transitioned into that category as a sinner who is not pleasing God and Solomon says here that when we're off in one area that's going to cause us to be off in another this becomes true with time management. Because for the man who is pleasing in God's sight, he gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. Those are gifts from God. But for the man who God calls a sinner, he gives the task of gathering and accumulating. How many of us are trying to gather and accumulate more time? See what Solomon is saying here? He's saying until we get our priorities straight, we'll never have enough time. Because when our priorities are straight, then we receive the wisdom from God on how to live our life. But when our priorities are wrong, we're not receiving wisdom from God. He is continuing to allow us to pursue things that are not according to His will there'll never be enough time. Because here's how it works. If I waste what I've been given, God's not going to give me any more. But that's not I don't take what I've been given and use it wisely, then I'm not going to get anything more. So, what are my priorities? Solomon has called us to that several times, but Solomon is not the only one who has called the you and me to this question. God calls us to this question. Jesus calls us to this question. The writers of the New Testament call us to this exact same question. And 
this is another reason why it's so important that we sit in self-judgment. It is not my responsibility to sit in self-judgment for you. That's your responsibility. It's my responsibility to sit in self-judgment of myself. But I tell you what is my responsibility. My responsibility is to warn you. That's what Ezekiel was required to do. God told Ezekiel that if you don't warn the people, I'm going to hold you responsible. But if you warn the people, then I will not hold you responsible for their actions. It's the exact same philosophy that Paul operated under. Paul said it was his responsibility to preach the whole counsel of God to warn people. This is what could be going on in your life. This could be your stumbling block. This could be the thing that keeps you from enjoying eternal life. So it's not my responsibility, it's not my job to sit in self-judgment of you, but it is my responsibility to warn you of what can happen and encourage you to take what the Word of God says and sit in self-judgment. One of the most important questions that we need to ask about time is, is why am I always running behind? Why do I not have enough time in the day? What are your priorities, Street? So here's what I know. Based upon what God has said. That when our priorities are according to his priorities, We'll always have plenty of all of his good gifts. You ever get tired? Why do we get so tired? Because we're not utilizing our time. Hear the word of God, church. There are things that you and I cannot control. And we are not held responsible for those. But there are many things in our life that we do control. And time is one. And we will be held accountable that gift. Would you come around my First and foremost, because ultimately everything's about God. The most important lesson that we've learned today is something we've learned about God. So, how great is God who is not limited by time or space? How great is the God that we serve? So every day. We should take time to contemplate upon how great God is. Focus our attention on God. How do I view life daily? We've been given today, haven't we? Are we guaranteed tomorrow? No, we're not. So, how do I view my daily life? 
Do I truly look at each day as a gift from God to thank Him for it? Or am I in such a hurry to get through today because of what I want or need to do tomorrow? So how do I view my life daily? And then am I using my time wisely? And I'm not talking about how the world defines using your time wisely. You know what one of Satan's most favorite tools is? It's called multitasking. <laughs> Satan is the one who invented multitasking. Because that just keeps you more distracted than ever. People, we need to slow down. We're wasting time. We are seriously wasting time on things that just don't matter. But I cannot use my time wisely if I don't have my priorities straight. But God has promised that when my priorities are straight, I'll have enough time to take care of my priorities. And all the other stuff, who needs it anyway? Who needs it anyway? I mean, what changes do I need to make to use the time I have been given wisely? Wisely. Time management begins with God. Time management begins with prioritizing our life around what God has said is most important for you and me in reference to Him and working for Him, glorifying Him and pleasing Him. Remember that key word to the one who pleases God He gives more. But to the one who does not please God, there's never enough. There's never enough. It's like that hamster on that wheel. It's going and going and going and going and going. Well, even the hamster has enough sense to get off the wheel occasionally. So what changes do I need to make in my life? so that I can use my time more effectively for God and his kingdom. Let's stay in a second. Hey, this goes with Brad's meditation. I'm glad you and Mike worked that out. <laughs> Send the light. There's a call comes rain or the restless way. Send the light. Send the light. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. Send the light. Send the light. Send the light. The blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light. The blessed gospel let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonia call today. Send the light, send the light. And the golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine. Send the light, send the light, and the Christ.
Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown of love. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine. people said. Amen. Children, great job this morning. Great job. Appreciate it very much. All right. Tell somebody what they did. You may see it. Just a few announcements and then to emphasize uh, some of the ones that are in the bulletin. Uh, first of all, um, we've determined not to have Sunday night service tonight. A lot of it has to do with coverage for our children's classes, but, uh, and kids, you did do a great job here this morning. Um, no Sunday evening service tonight. As far as for the rest of the week, we will, Wednesday night, next Sunday, we'll be back on regular schedule. Okay. We just pray that that will be able to happen. There will be no ladies' Bible study tomorrow evening. The Monday night ladies' Bible study will not be meeting tomorrow evening. Obviously, there's no carry-in dinner today. That will be scheduled for another time in the near future. Um, there's still a few unclaimed items in the kitchen. Take care of those. Uh, they'll probably be taken care of for you if you don't take care of them soon this week. Uh, check the mailbox. There's some things there. There's some open spots uh, for Children's Church, Music Specials, and Nursery. So see those on the table and volunteer for that. Also, the address and phone number directories for the church are finished and they're available out on the table. Any other announcements this morning? Would you all be standing for our benediction? Dear Lord God, Holy and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for this chance that we have to come together, Lord. And Lord, Lord, right now, it's a special blessing to all of those that are not with us tonight, or today, Lord, that you uh, watch over them and keep them safe, Lord, and Lord, that they uh, may get well and come back to us soon. Lord, as we leave this place, I hope that we uh, take what we heard to heart, Lord, and to mind, that we can better use our time and be better stewards of you, Lord, and that we can be better servants of you. And Lord, I ask you all these things in your name. His name pray. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns. 